If you're a driven, active person who wants to reach and pursue a higher quality life with some ambition, then guess what? This podcast is for you. This is the Driven Athlete Podcast. What's up, y'all? It's your man, Dr. Kyle. Welcome back. We have a really cool guest today, and we're really appreciative for him to come in here and, and help bring some encouragement, some inspiration, and share a little bit more about him. But this is Riley Opelka, professional tennis player, uh, the tallest guy I think I've ever been in contact with in my whole life. I'm sure he gets that a lot. But share a little bit more about what you're doing now, uh, what you've been doing, your professional tennis uh, status currently, in the, at least the past couple of years. Yeah, I've been, um, I mean, this year has been a weird one. Um, 12 months ago, I had hit my first uh, surgery. So I had hip surgery, recovered from that, and um, ended up, you know, needing a wrist surgery. So I've been, I've been out of commission for the last um, year exactly. So the last six months have just been rehab training and, you know, progressing back to um, tennis, back to my normal yeah. um, routine. So that's been, um, it's been a different year. I have been traveling 35 plus weeks a year, every year since I've been 18. And now um, this is just a whole different That's crazy. setup. Yeah. That's a lot of, tra- that's a lot of traveling. It is. And before your injury, so like last September, August is when you started having issues with your hip, correct? And that's when you had surgery. Yep. Before that, where were you at with your tennis career? Um, I was, I was definitely at my best. You know, I the hard part was I had stopped at my career high. It's not like I had, um, I had let my hip get so bad, and and my a lot of that happens a lot with athletes, right? They wait till something gets so bad, and then their performance is dropping and and they kind of just do the surgery because they're not performing well anymore i was right. um it was difficult because i'd known about the hip for a while and i was still able to work around it and play great tennis so I, you know it's hard to make the decision to go under the knife yeah. you know at, at your peak right so and it, you were 17 in the world that yeah point? yeah and it wasn't i mean that's extremely challenging to get there yeah yeah it's tough to get there and it, it is and it takes time to get there and you know and it's like oh man i gotta throw out the next year and rebuild and I'm I was still healthy I was still able to play but I just knew it was coming where I couldn't anymore um I had too many ups and downs I wasn't really able to train so I I think I made the right decision to get the hip done when I did and surgery went great yeah yeah wrist different story yeah yeah all right which we'll we can get into as appropriate but before even before that I wanted to ask to lead up to the point where you were 17 in the world which is incredible um let's we'll we'll dive into that a little bit more but to begin with when did you start playing tennis uh i was five five years old yep and this was in north florida north florida palm coast and just because it was like a activity for the summer that your parents just wanted to get rid of you for a a couple hours (laughs) yeah it was um yeah there was i we moved from michigan but it was a lot of tennis courts i think my dad's company had moved his boss um wanted like his boss loved tennis and it's tougher to play tennis in, in the Midwest and yeah. and get court time and stuff. His son also was my age, and he played tennis. And I think, I mean, all in all, it's a better quality of life in Florida. And he was just, yeah. so why don't we just move the company down? And then um, I started kind of playing tennis, too. I don't know if it was, you know, because he was, it, my dad and his boss were good friends. So um, I think maybe the seed was kind of planted in my dad's mind. Oh, yeah, we'll throw Riley in there, too. And yeah. and I loved it. So Yeah, yeah. Um, it, was that always your go-to activity? Like when you started playing, you were five, and you since then were like, I really want to play tennis. I like playing tennis. Yeah. There wasn't like any like basketball. I played football, basketball. Soccer. I never played organized basketball. Um, I played t-ball, and then that yeah, was I mean, that. Who does, yeah, who does? And then, uh, yeah, it was one season of t-ball and then tennis from there. But I yeah. played a ton of basketball growing up, but never anything organized, just pick up. Yeah. But I played every day. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And I imagine then, though, I mean, I've always been an advocate for multi-sports. I played a ton of sports growing up, played two sports in college, and I feel like there's a lot of carryover that could help with whatever your main sport is, where your heart's at. I mean, there's, I would imagine basketball, the quickness, agility, explosion, all that stuff, would, and hand-eye coordination, of course. Yeah. Foot-eye coordination, a lot of carryover that would probably help with your tennis ability. Yeah, yeah, for sure. With So when did you start? You, so you started playing at five, continue to play. That was your thing. When did you start noticing yourself getting significantly more um, uh, progressing better than some of your, your peers and stuff? You started standing out amongst everybody else. Um, hard to say, like, you know, because there in that part of, of North Florida, I was definitely like, you know, I was definitely really good. I, I was playing in North Florida. Ten- tennis isn't known to have as like the competition levels it does in South Florida, for right. example. So 
you know, I was playing even at seven, eight years old. I was definitely better than no than the rest for sure. Yeah. But um, I wasn't. You know, I'd come down to South Florida and you know I'd get my ass kicked. So oh really? Yeah. Um, but like I was just youth tournaments. Yeah, in youth tournaments, I was always good, but I wasn't. You know, there was a couple kids that you know we still talk about now and joke about how good they were at, at the time. And interesting. Can you disclose? Are they currently still playing? Um, no. No. Okay, so they never like, never continued, really? No. But they were just good. Yeah, they were just good. So yeah. what happened to them then? Just, I mean, this is, you're talking age, you know, 11, 12, 13, yeah. 14, but they went on to play college tennis, um, and that some, maybe not even, but yeah. at that age, they were just so good. Yeah. It's just a whole, it's just a different thing. Yeah, that's true, true. And um, so there's so many different names that you see that come and go in junior tennis, and it's hard to say, like, um, the kids that I... You know, by age fourteen, you can kind of have a telltale for who's going to be good and who yeah. who won't be. But prior to that, it's hard to say. I never had the mindset of like, you know, I'm definitely the best in this. I never, I didn't start thinking about pursuing it as a pro until I was like, you know, thirteen, let's say. Yeah. Um, but prior gotcha. to that, I was just trying to, you know, I was just competitive. I loved it. Yeah. And it was, um, yeah, it, it never was a job. And else came naturally. Yeah. So, so you were crushing it in North Florida. Would come down for junior tournaments in South Florida. You were hands down winning easily in, up in your competition there. Come here and it's a little more challenging. Yeah. Did that? Did that? How did that affect you? Like confidence wise, or you like, hey, this is expected and time to grow? Were you like, oh gosh, I'm not as good as I thought? Yeah. Yes and no. I never like. I, I never was worried about that. I was never worried about someone being. Um, maybe about not being good enough or not. I mean, I think we never had the mindset of like going and like winning these tournaments. It was just to kind of have fun and get better and got it. And it was that sort of thing. We always prioritized. Uh, it was a it was an experience, you know. Yeah. We I mean, my dad and I drive down on the weekends and we'd go to a fun restaurant and go stop. We'd see other things. It wasn't just tennis. So I think that made it, um, you know, made it more. I didn't feel like the world was revolving around the tournament. Got it. Even when we drive down yeah. for it, yeah, yeah, we'd stop and see things, and I don't know. It was just, it was fun. It was more of an activity. Yeah. Even till age thirteen. That's cool. Yeah. Well, it was good. It was a good bonding experience, I would imagine. Yeah. So what, when you did start progressing a little bit more than some of your peers and colleagues, and you were considering professional direction, what age was that? Um. I moved down to South Florida when I was 13 to train at the USDA, the training center there. And and that's in Delray? Yeah, that was in Boca Raton. Boca Raton. Okay. Yeah. And that was that's kind of when things changed a lot. You know, they bring in like three or four of the best kids from each part of the, I mean, from every, all parts of the country, but each year you get three kids. So I was, you know, born in 97. So we were the youngest at the time. So, you know, we had three kids in 96, 95, all the way to 92. Okay. And that was a new program that Patrick McEnroe, um, John McEnroe's brother, had created. So he just said, I want to get the three best kids from each each year, and I want to give them the best resources we yeah. can give them and build a good training environment and invest in the future as opposed to, like, our current talent. Right. And I think that philosophy was amazing. Yeah. And um, it took a long time to see results. And um, unfortunately, like, somewhat by the time Patrick McEnroe had invested in the youth, and we were just starting to kind of prove how great that idea was. Everyone else in like the tennis world was criticizing the now. Like they were like, oh, no one's, we don't have that many guys. We have three guys in the top 100. Patrick McEnroe is not doing a great job. Mm. And then, you know, had they just been a little bit more patient, we have 15, 16 guys now in the top 100 as opposed to three about 10 years ago. So it's safe to say I think he was on the right, right. The right path with that. That's cool. But that program was special. That's really cool. Would you say then, with those people down there, would you say Macaro was one of your mentors, influential people? You know, it's fun. Like, not I, we didn't see him at all as players, like as juniors. We didn't see him there, um, and I think that's what was so brilliant. He really just found the best coaches, and he trusted them, yeah, and let them do your thing. Do yeah, yeah. And um, you know, there's a guy named Tom Gullickson that I met in Palm Coast who lived there. Former, you know, it was a crazy story that I met him and. Um, he was the he was San Francisco's coach, Agassi's coach, and happened to live in Palm Coast. And him and my dad became great friends. That's cool. And then yeah, I started playing tennis. Him and I actually moved down to Boca together. When I was thirteen, he moved down as well to become a, a USTA lead national coach. 
And um, so it was just funny how the timing of all that yeah. worked out. And um, that's really cool. Yeah, that's where tennis started to become more serious. I started training. You know, I started, it was the first time I ever lifted a weight, first time I ever yeah. ran on a track for tennis. I couldn't believe I was doing that. Yeah, and that's cool. Um, and that didn't, did it? Did you ever get burnout during that phase? No. You just loved it. Yeah. I mean, I, I hated the track and I yeah. hated, or we'd run around the soccer field. I well, hated it. Like, like, no one likes conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was terrible. And, you know, some of the practice days, yeah, the drills were, you know, we all, but it was worth it to go, you know, four days a week or in the afternoon session, we get to play points against each other and get competitive. So yeah. all the things I hated about the day were, um, you know, I got to make up for it just in the one hour in the afternoon when we just get to go play like live ball yeah. point, points against one another. Who, who were you with at that time that was in your group category, like in your age categories? Tommy Paul was my roommate. We lived in the dorms. Um, and then we shared a bathroom with, uh, and then the other room was like Taylor Fritz and, Francis TFO was pretty much right down the hall. Yeah. And Tommy and Taylor, uh, they're still doing really well. And Francis. They're, and Francis. They're 8, 10, and 11 in the world. Man, that's crazy. Yeah. So you had 17, 8, 10, and 11, those four guys at one point. Yeah. Those were the guys, the kids training at that point. Yep. So that, I mean, like you said, like with McEnroe's vision, that worked out well. Super. Yeah. yeah. It's a whole different vision now. Now it's a whole totally different thing. How so? It was, you know, the part that I always praised Patrick for was he said no, meaning like you can imagine crazy tennis parents. You can imagine crazy sports parents, but tennis parents are are up there with all the crazies. Yeah, yeah, and, um, you know, oh, how come my kid doesn't get a chance? Why is – and and the cool thing was like I, I wasn't ranked top in the country when they selected me. They, they had coaches. That I think they liked – my dad was tall, my mom was tall, and I was a good athlete, but yeah. I wasn't – the best tennis player at the time at 12 years old and and they um they selected me which was um cool because obviously they weren't just looking at rankings they had really right. done their homework yeah and i think that you know that mindset you can imagine how american parents are and oh my kid should have the same chance and and i think patrick was so good about just saying no like he was brutally honest and yeah. and that's what he was so good at and, and at the end of the day parents came around for him because they might not have agreed with him, but he was always honest. Yeah, yeah. So they saw the future, the, the potential, right? You, uh, if if y'all don't know, Riley is seven foot, right? Seven foot flat. Yep. It's, it's crazy. Um, how tall were you at thirteen? And then when did you shoot up? I was like five six, I think. I mean, no, I about a normal. I don't. I shot up a lot when I was sixteen. Sixteen. Yeah. And they just kept going. Yep. When did you get seven foot? How old? Probably 18, 19. 19, 18, 19. Okay. Yeah. Got it. That's, that's crazy. But that's awesome that they saw the vision and and uh, just the potential and the, and the belief that you could be the guy, you know? Yeah. I mean, they just – Patrick hired the best coaches in the world. I mean, we had we had coaches. And that was the other thing. He'd get criticized. Oh, you're not, there's no American coaches. Everyone, But he said, I want to have the best talent in the world. And he f hired, you know, guys from Argentina, Spain – um, Germany, you name it. He, yeah. he took the best coaches in the yeah, world. Yeah. It's such a simple philosophy. Like, let me just bring the best coaches in the world and the best best players in the country, and yeah. try to try to build a champion out of it. And and he did. It worked. Right. And I think that when you hire the best coaches like that, and that's what their job is. They're experts. They saw the game growing. Medvedev is you know six five. Sitsipas, Zverev. All these guys now are um, six three plus. Yeah. That's cool. I always feel like I, I go back to for my own self and then for my my team members and stuff like you are who you hang out with. And the culture starts with that at the top, especially with the coaches and stuff. And that culture is going to trickle down. So getting a players on the on board. Right. And then not disrespecting the rest of the team by getting B players on board or B co whatever. Right. Because yep. um, eventually they'll get flushed out. Totally. Because right? B players then or B uh, team members, they're going to usually allow C players to come in, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And those, they end up getting flushed out, and then uh, the culture end up shifting, or just not, not, not the best direction, at least from what I've seen. Yeah. But anyway, you are hanging out with, right? Totally. So you guys all together with the best coaches in the world, I mean, it's only going to set you up for success. So, I mean, I always feel like I'm an advocate with that, with just anybody in general, with their friend groups and stuff, you know? Like, you are the average of the five people you hang out with most. Mm -hmm. So doing a deep dive and, and reflection on, like, who are, you know, if I am, then what is that? You know, what's that look like? But anyway, that's really cool. It set y'all up for success huge, hugely, you know. Yeah. Um, 
so if you had to name off a couple of people, who are the most, some of the most influential mentors or our coaches and stuff you've had to help you get to where you are now? Oh, there's so many. Uh, I mean, Tom, it's, it kind of starts with one, obviously my dad is, but um, it went from Tom Gullickson to, you know, a guy named Mike Sell to Diego Moyano to Jay Berger and Jim Lair, who's a psychologist. Those are the, he's not a, he's the, he's the, greatest he's the guy yeah he's the guy he wrote the book on all of it but that's cool gully diego jay diego was special um diego moyano that came um he worked with me tommy and taylor only and francis a little bit but mainly us three from age 15 on and we weren't good at until we started working with him yeah yeah. like he came at the perfect time and um argentinian guy super tough and i think we really needed that as you know three american kids yeah he just different perspective you know like we'd go play tournaments and you know i'd lose i thought i tried but you know and and everything was fine and he'd be upset and we were kind of like and and um from he would share his perspective i remember one time he was like yeah i used to sleep at my friends my my dad had a friend that had a clothing store in argentina i'd sleep on the floor of a shop I had no money, you know, he's, I'd walk to the, I'd run three miles to the courts, warm up for my match and go play. And, and I had no money. The only way I could get home was if I won that match. And, and so just the mindset of like that, that he had of just really fighting the grind. This. Yeah. And it was nice. It was cool. Like yeah. every, and he really made us realize what we were, what we'd had, you know, we had free coaching, free travel. And as American kids, you don't realize, I guess, what that is there's kids that would give an arm and a leg for that or their parents would pay everything they could for that and we got it for free so I think he really like did a great job giving us like insight into his background and how lucky we were so we never really were so entitled right and that environment definitely could breed an entitled right kid yeah totally and I think Diego is a huge reason why um we weren't yeah I don't imagine too the he did it so and he's coaching you and sharing this stuff versus like you need to be like this and they never really did that themselves like yeah the credibility and legitimacy is going to be there a little bit higher for someone like diego yeah for sure yeah as an argentine you know and then we go play tournaments overseas my first time out of country and and you know you'd see the spanish guys just these kids they're our age but they're ripped they've been training their whole life and grunting and so intense and and i remember you know i was like oh it's just it's just like Diego, you know, I, yeah. I wasn't intimidated because that was like, that's our coach pretty much. Which the, little Diego is running around. Yeah, exactly. Like, know exactly what this is about. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so currently then now, oh, so, and Jay Berger is your coach now, yep. correct? Jay's my coach now. He was the head of men's tennis. He ran the whole program. That's who Patrick had hired to oversee the whole thing. Gotcha. So with tournaments up till the past year, Jay would travel with you. Yeah, he does. He goes to um, about eight of them, let's say a year and then I have another guy that does a lot because we travel so much yeah and Jay does all my weeks at home we have a kind of a little program like that he comes to the big ones and and then I have another guy that comes to um comes to all the other ones yeah he's great as well I should have mentioned him Jean-Yves Abone great and coach great coach yep we started off when I first came down here and started working with Jay I was uh 20 and I was 250 in the world and we needed a coach because Jay just didn't want to travel anymore. And he'd been playing a lot. He's yeah. been on tour, former top 10 in the world. And we needed to find a coach. And Jay just said, give me a guy that's young that I can still spar with yeah. and is professional and wants to become a better coach. Yeah. And Jay was coaching him and I. So Jay was coaching him how to be a, a great coach and coaching me how to be a great player. Yeah. And we both, JY, who's the guy that I travel with, learned so much from him and I learned so much from each other and from Jay. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. How many weeks a year would you travel? 30 plus. 30, 35. Yeah. That's crazy. So yeah. Jay would go on eight of those, on the big ones. Yeah. And then yeah. the coach would, would go through the other 20, yep. 28 of them, yep. 25. That's crazy. That's awesome. That's a ton of traveling. It's a ton of traveling. How do you handle that? I'm used to it. It's all I've kind of known. Just living out of a suitcase. Yeah. Yep, living out of a suitcase and packing up and going. You're never home. Yeah. That, I, I mean, uh, you're super used to it at this point. So yep. it's just like second nature. Um, with that being said, then, you're traveling a ton, 30-plus weeks a year, right? How do you maintain uh, the regimen you need to with training, recovery, sleep, 
nutrition, um, and then also just skills, right? Yeah. One thing that we have easy is tennis is our whole, it's my whole life. So like if I don't, you know, and it's an individual sport. So if I land in Germany and I, I'm jet lagged and practice at 9, 10 a.m., I have a coach and a physio that kind of work around me. So if I don't yeah. sleep well and I want to bump practice to four, I can. Yeah. So in some way, so you can adjust your schedule pretty, yeah. pretty easily. Uh, yeah, we do have the ultimate freedom in that regard, but we need it because, you know, we travel so much. We're in a different time zone and a different continent every week. So, um, but I do those things. I'm not, I try not to be married to my, my practice times at 10 a.m. If I may, of course, if I'm going to go, I'm going to be there on time and whatnot. But if I need more sleep because I didn't sleep well yeah, or I didn't, you know, I woke up late, I didn't get to eat, I don't feel right we try to maximize all my time on court and it'd be better just to bump it back to three, 4 PM. Yeah. yeah. So giving yourself some grace on like, yo, I don't feel right. Let's just bump it. Yep. I think it's an interesting concept too. Cause I feel, I hear that a lot with some of my, with the patients and clients we work with where they're like, I didn't work out today. Or, I, I didn't, I made it, you know, I didn't, I didn't have time. Right. Yep. Or, I didn't make it. It's like giving yourself some grace and be like, it's okay. You know, you can skip a day and it's totally fine. And also like you can bump it back or change your schedule just to whatever necessary. Yeah. If you're not feeling right. Um, so what does it look like? Like routine wise, what does that look like? So you would have, um, uh, physio, right? Yep. So if I'm hitting, you know, if I'm playing a match, let's say, yeah. and I'm the hard part with tennis is the schedule. Your, your first, first on is my favorite time to play. Cause I know when I'm going to start. But if I'm second match on, third match on, I have no clue yeah. how that's going to go. Right. I'm. I like to shower. I have kind of a whole routine. But if I'm playing at eleven, I'm going to be with my physio at uh, seven forty-five. We'll be on the table from seven forty-five, uh, you know, till nine, and then um, I will hit from nine to nine thirty for only thirty minutes, and then I go right away eat so I can digest. And I shower, regrip my rackets, get ready to go. And then 15 minutes before I'm starting to do a dynamic warm up, catch some tennis balls he's throwing at me, get yeah. my eyes ready. And, and then, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Um, and then, do you, what about workouts? Do you work out during the travel and season stuff? Totally. Yeah. It's just everything's up in the air. You know, I don't know if I'm going to play my first round match, I could win. Yeah. I could lose. I could win in an hour. I could lose in three hours. I could win in three hours and then have to play the next day. Yeah. So everything is, we just have to, it's all about being flexible at this point. Yeah. You know, sometimes if I'm, if I win, let's say I win in straight sets. So it's only two sets. I'm out of there in an hour and a half. I'll go get a lift in right after. Um, and then, you know, I'll have the next day, let's say off to, I just have a practice day and then my match day might be the following day. We're just, we don't know those things till last minute. We're always kind of adapting. Yeah. So what, what would the goal been the, be then with workouts twice a week or three times a week during, like this is during travel, right? During travel, um, there's, I mean, we're doing stuff literally every single day of no matter what, we're doing some form of, of a workout, but just like your classic lift yeah. where you're actually moving weight and you're yeah. loading up decently. Yeah. Two days a week. Twice a week. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty standard. What we hear across the sports performance board is like uh, during season, twice a week maintenance type of workouts. So, because we have a lot of patients that are student athletes, right? College and high school and also youth. And like, oh, I'm in season. I want to work out. It's like every single, uh, you know, professional that we've collaborated with and across the board, it seems like the, the standard at least to shoot for is twice a week for just maintenance yeah. and not avoiding working out. Because it's supposed to help build and fortify and keep things moving and grooving appropriately and also lower the risk of injury. Yeah. Um, and then that's off-season-wise. Then we get after a little bit more aggressively. But you're, like, constantly always in season. So you're going to be usually just twice a week is the main goal. Yep. For your recovery, because I remember you were telling me before, like, if you have a two-a-day, right, like if you have two matches in one day, you have a three-hour match, right yep and then later that day you have to do another match and you're just like I'm, we're wiped you know like um or the next day you, you have another match it's going to be a grueling one you had a three-hour one before that what what seems to be the most influential things for you for recovery it's like oh i know i can do this and i'll feel a lot better ready for the next one i mean i i like to work with a lot of i mean just soft tissue work for me is great we spend a lot of time after matches on the i spend a lot of time on the table in general yeah. Um, and a lot of hip, hip and ankle mobs before and after I get those done constantly. Um, and I do a ton of soft tissue, um, mainly on the areas that flare up and we'll get in with the scraper. Yeah. 
and that avoids for me that like when we really get rough with the scraper and like in those moments when I'm really fired up and sore I I it helps me out a ton avoiding getting like serious doms like yeah. serious really soreness yeah. yeah and that's that's key for me the more violent we get with with the tissue work yeah the better i i usually feel it's rough yeah no like most people don't like that yeah you know yeah no that's it, it sucks but it's pain with a purpose you know it's what we tell our patients like hey we're gonna do some soft tissue stuff but it's pain with a purpose yeah for for overarching goal yeah and i think i've done a good job of performing late in tournaments like once i've i've gotten there you know, it's yeah. I'm sore because I'm not here just to win the first two matches. You want to try to push for the. So we at tennis players always think long term. So when I'm first round after a tough match, I I'm, I'm gonna have um, I'm gonna get dug in with the scraper tool yeah. like hard. Like one spot, my medial hamstring on the left side always comes up. Interesting. My cuff on the right and my left oblique. So we'll dig in pretty hard in those areas, and then because I'm gonna be sore no matter what the next day. But if I win that match, come semis and finals, let's say, which is where I want to be, I usually I've my body's never really let me down later on in a tournament. And, uh, yeah. and sometimes I've just gotten my body's gotten better as the tournament's gone on because we we um, we kind of have that approach of like let's just take the take the steps to feel better in like four or five days. Yeah, all right, uh, and that's a good mindset I feel like too. Just thinking further ahead versus now or the next hour or yeah. that night. And also, too, just in case y'all didn't know, DOMS, when Riley was saying DOMS, it's delayed onset muscle soreness. And that's just like the soreness you get after intense workouts and stuff. Um, but so intense soft tissue, yep. scraping, grasping, stripping, yep. like cu cupping, cupping, all that stuff. That seems to be the best thing for your soreness and body recovery. Yeah. And eating. I was going to say, okay, eating. Eating. So what's your, for eating stuff, uh, our nutrition, right? What's your go-tos? Like, what do you always like? I always feel great when I eat this. I have to be really regimented with this. Or you're like, ah, oh, not really regimented. I'm kind of like flexible with that too. Yeah. When I'm, I notice like, so when I'm at tournaments, there's, when I'm in tournament mode and I'm, there's not a single time of the day where I ever feel hungry. I think that's, that's when I perform my best. When I'm snacking, you know, I'm eating before every practice at the right time. Yeah. And I do a much better job of that when I'm at tournaments than when I'm at home. And I think that that's a huge part. My energy is just high throughout the whole day. When I'm on court, I'm I'm snacking on something. I'm yeah. having a bar. As soon as practice is done, you know, we go right to the player dining. I'll have a little snack. That's nice. I'm just eating nonstop. What do you eat? So snacking, um, like protein bars, granola bars, like what? Yeah, I'll do, I'll do granola, um, just regular raw granola, protein bars, um, protein shakes, dates. Um, and then we do have a nice spread at every tournament of food for the most part we do for, especially the big ones. Um, you know, I eat a lot of sushi. I like to have a lot of fish and, and rice and, um, and then in the slams, you know, I have to, I eat a lot of carbs. I have to have a lot of pasta just in case I'm playing yeah. four or five hours. So, right. um, chicken, pasta, suit, I eat a ton of Japanese food in general. Um, uh, that's just one of my favorites, but just clean fish and rice can't yeah. go wrong uh, yeah um yeah that's kind of what things do you, have you eaten that we would think otherwise great choices you know great nutritional uh things to go for that you don't agree with that your body just doesn't just doesn't do well with um i don't i don't do well with like a sandwich before i play for example i i i really avoid you know, as, as a kid, it was like, oh, yeah, sandwich. Just PB and J. PB and J I love, but but I actually do a lot of PB and J on, oh, okay. on, on the court. Okay. But like turkey, cheese, lettuce, sandwich, all that bread. I don't know. For some reason, I, I really have a hard time. Yeah. I feel sluggish whenever I eat a big sandwich yeah, yeah. before okay. I play. And I do it a lot here in Florida because, you know, I love like public sub. Oh, pub subs are the best. Pub subs are the best. What about the chicken tender sub? Chicken tender sub's amazing. Yeah. I don't do that one, but I do just even the – or even Jersey Mike's just because I like solid. them. They're solid, but yeah. um, that's a big, you know, no-go. I'll do it before practice, and I'm only doing it because I like the – and it's convenient, it's easy, yeah. but it's definitely – like I could never pull that off in a tournament. That will never be a pre-meal. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I hear that a lot with some people too. I think including myself, like the processed meat, I think it may be a big influence of that also. But um, I mean, because being sluggish and also a good idea of what you know and you like and don't like. But uh, man, pub subs are always going to be high on my list. <laughs> yeah, they're the best. Just driving real quick. Yeah, love that. Um, 
okay, what's your favorite pub sub then? I always go roast beef, cheese. Roast beef and cheese. And ranch dressing. At ranch yep. on the roast beef. Yep. Interesting. That's my go-to. Okay. Yeah. What pickles? Green, I, green just, peppers? Just red peppers? Uh, just onions and lettuce. Onions. Yeah. Okay. Onions, onion, lettuce, yeah. and that's like it. Onion. With the ranch? Yep. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Not what I would have. Not, that's not my pick, but uh, I'm a, I'm definitely a, a chicken tender guy with with blue cheese and ranch. Nice. And then uh, the ultimate, I think. Um, and I'll put mayo on that. I'm a mayo guy. Nice. I'm not a mayo mustard guy. I don't like it mixed together. Yeah, I don't do that either. I don't know how people do that. It's not my thing. No. But uh, and their pickles are really good. I don't, recently I was like, I haven't been missing out this whole time on these pickles. Like they're just like super crispy and cool. I don't know. I'm a pickle guy with them. That's my cheat meal. The cheat meal. Pub, pub sub. Pub sub, yeah. Okay, if it's oh yeah, what's your other cheat meal? If it's not pub sub, what's your other cheat meal? Um I have a sweet tooth. I mean, I have a hard time. I I always have to fight saying no to any dessert. But yeah, that's my go to. What's your favorite dessert? All of them. But I like <laughs> everything. I, everything. <laughs> yeah. I like chocolate chip cookies a lot. Okay. Yeah. I like cookies. I like yeah. Everything. Everything's sweet. Yeah. I'm a cookie guy. Yeah. I'm a cookie guy for sure. Cake. Uh, soda, yeah, I have a total sweet tooth for candy. Sweet tarts are like my favorite. Sweet tarts, yeah, I'll, I have a really. That's my soft that's a Halloween. Spot. That's a Halloween classic. Yeah, so I really have to fight that, you know. And I saw there was an article or an interview with Djokovic that came out when he had won Australian Open, I think, and um, or maybe broke the record in France this year. I, it was one. Of, it was a huge moment for him, and he had his first. Uh, squ- one little square of a chocolate bar. He said was his reward for himself. It was the first one he'd had in years. Huh? So, Interesting. Wow. Like, that, m- my cheat meal comes once a week. Yeah. Maybe twice a week, and it's a pub sub. Yeah. And he's having one one square of chocolate, and he's you know. Interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. And dedication. You know, consistency. Um. Okay. Switching gears a little bit. So. You were mentioned. I mean, recently you've battled some he- some health stuff, injury stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Which the goal is for just to be a speed bump and then eventually be stronger on the other end, of course. But we can't deny the mental game is very impactful for consistency for success mm-hmm. and maintaining confidence and then also trajectory and incur- all that stuff. Um, what aspect of the psychology component would you say has been really impactful for you to maintain that good headspace and then consistency? Journaling. Yeah, writing. I write a lot. Writing down twice a day before my day starts and at the very, very end of the day. Journaling what? How you're feeling, what the goal is for the day. Yeah, the goal. yeah everything. Yeah. I mean, it's nice to – and it, you also write things down. It could be the smallest thing. Like I could be in the gym with, with Cressy, and he could make a remark on my RDL. let say, oh, it would, it's as basic as – you know. May, it, there's some, the one thing that frustrates me is I'll be on like set two or three, and like I'll find a cue or an adjustment that really helps me, and I feel yeah. the exercise a lot more. And then I go and I write that down, and then – you know, I'll reflect on it, and then let's say in two, three days when we have that same program again, yeah. I'll remember that. That way, all my sets in there, the three sets of that exercise, are all going to be can be as efficient as possible. Yeah, and I think it's key for efficiency and just trying to get better. Yeah. How often do you do you reflect on those journals? Every day. Yeah, I'll scroll every day. I'll just to kind of, I'll you know, and I'll rewrite a lot of the same things. I'll look at the previous day or the previous day. And, or even the day before that to see like, you know, what I liked, what I didn't, just to write it again down to make sure it's fresh in yeah. the front of my head. And yeah, yeah. Right now, uh, I mean, for the past year, you've been you, with the hip surgery, like yep. you said, um, wrist surgery. Yep. Um, that's been a journey, right? Yep. And the the most, I would say, what you, what you were saying, the most major event for injuries for you throughout your career so far. Right, where you had to like stop and and yeah, spend a lot of time rehabbing and stuff. What's going into that? What was your mindset? The, did you, or did you not know it was going to be as long? Yeah, as Yeah, no idea. Yeah, the hip went smooth. I thought I'd be back, and and it did because it felt great afterwards, right? Yeah, the hip was easy. Yeah, and then the wrist kind of just came on unexpected. Just you know, it's just a fluke incident, yeah. and and then. Um, and then, you know, I went in with the impression, it's like, oh, this sucks, but I'm only going to be out for, it was six weeks of mobilized and then six weeks of rehab and I can get on course. I'm like, all right, three more months. You know, I've already learned how it is with the hip, all good. But then yeah. the surgery was unsuccessful. It got infected. So then it was, it was another surgery and, 
and then that led to you know being immobilized for four months yeah. so that then you it's just a whole different beast the, the surgery and the injury are almost irrelevant it's just it's all it's just i was immobilized for four months yeah so another recovery afterwards a little yeah. more prolonged yeah and you've been going through some stuff we've been working together getting things strong and stable and progressing appropriately um from this point forward what's your vision next like you, you want to do some tournaments coming up yeah in the fall yep. correct and then grind back out to yeah to major tournaments yep i want to use the rest of the year to get as many matches under my belt as i can without my hand blowing up you yeah know? that's just the that's the goal just because you never know with setbacks it's just normal when you're trying to get back into it things flare up inflammation whether it's your my my hand my shoulder my elbow yep. i haven't used it so yeah yeah um trying to account for those things and yeah. and be as cause you, i just don't want to miss any days i'd rather and the only way to know your limit is to push it or to get past it Test and the water realize path. okay that didn't work yeah now i got to take a week off and that's kind of been the, the that's been the story of the last couple couple weeks here yeah i think uh i mean it's interesting you say that because for athletes, people recovering from injuries and stuff, the progressions are never like straight linear, right? There's always like good days, bad days, good days, bad days. But with yeah. the right guidance approaches and, and the right mindsets, um, the overall trend over a period of months is supposed to be a positive trend, right? Yep. Uh, but with good days and bad days in between, we just want to avoid the roller coaster of like, oh, now I have really big, set, you know, huge setback. And like now everything's stuck. And now I'm not going to get better. And the discouragement that comes with. Yep. Uh, but at least keeping things to be a little bit more mediated of the roller coaster. Um, and like you said, I mean, you can't even like, you have to test the water a little bit. That's where yep. you know your threshold's at. Then, okay, let's reflect back up a little bit, test the water back up a little bit. And that ends up being overall helping the, the progressions and, and positive trend we're looking for. Yep. Right. Um, with, uh, with training coming up now, so you're, you're weaning back into, um, impact stuff with tennis, yep. right? You've been training really hard at Cressy's with sports, uh, with weight training, yep. performance training, and also conditioning. Correct. Yep. Um, and then also weaning with coach with Coach Berger, Jay, um, tennis skills and stuff. Right. Um, continuing that same progression is the goal. Correct. Yep. What's if you had to ramp anything up right now? What would be the next thing to implement more of? Tennis. The tennis. Tennis. Yeah. I, uh, that's my goal is to eventually um, start to spend less time in the gym because I've had four months of being in there a lot uh, every day. Um, and I've lifted a lot. Of, I've moved a lot of weight. I'm really strong. I would like to, you know, have that go on the back burner, for hopefully here in the next couple of weeks and just um, be able to play tennis as much as I want Yeah. and get my skills back because that's all I care about yeah. at the end of the day. Right, totally. Uh, I mean, tennis, that's that's the thing that's going to make you successful in your sport. Yep. Um, and then also it's interesting too is the – for any athlete, right, injuries are expected It's at some point. People come up with setbacks and, and – um, getting injured or, or just a slump, right? Or not bad headspace, whatever. Um, durability is definitely seems to be the most important thing for any athlete where it's like, if you're not on the court or on the field, like you can't play yeah. and you're not going to get looks, you're not going to get the playing time, right? Yep. Th that's the most important thing is just the durability and getting playing time. Mm -hmm. Um, but for anyway, but for athletes or even active people that want to work out and do stuff and improve their life going through what you just going through, what suggestions would you have for people? Um, it, it's every, everyone's just so different, but I think always, I think taking matters in your own hands at all times is just in general, whether in sports is always seems to be the best option, even with, even with rehab, even with protocols, like, you know, you're dealing with, oh, the, the protocol calls for this, this, and this, I've kind of, what I've learned after all the surgeries and, and protocols and, and everything is to, is to really just take ownership of yourself if it says you know by week six you're here do i personally haven't haven't um loved that i i follow that for a while but rehabbing the patient over the protocol i think is key and i think just that that mindset and and all sorts of training is super important yeah whether you have to take two three days off whether you have to whether you need to ramp up whether you need to do more um i i think it's important to be so in tune with your own body and yourself yeah. with sports to be to have the confidence to be able to make those calls yeah totally um i mean confidence is key so you you would say owning owning your own process yep and um 
taking matters in your own hands. Yep. Which is, I mean, owning. Are you familiar? Remind me. It just reminds me of what uh, two things that I've heard. You know, Jocko Willink. If you're familiar with, he's a Navy SEAL. Yeah. Wrote, okay, he wrote that yep. book, Extreme Ownership. Yep. And I've always loved that. I'm like everything. It ultimately comes down to to, uh, to yourself. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Owning a business, or your own journey in fitness, like your own nutrition, whatever. Um, ultimately, it's it's my own responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. And there's somebody else that it makes me think of too. Her, her name's Cody Sanchez. She's a young entrepreneur that um, just goes to handles a lot of stuff. And she was reading this book um, that's more of a, on the Eastern medicine or Eastern uh, type of philosophy stuff, like Far East stuff. And uh, she was like, "You are your own greatest responsibility." And that's a tough pill for people to swallow, you know, where mm-hmm. it's like, "Oh, this happened to me. This happened to me," or like, "I can't do this." So ultimately, it's it's uh you are your own responsibility you know and definitely can gather people and who you are hang out you who you are you hang out with right um to set yourself for success as best as possible so anyway i definitely agree with all that stuff and i think that's only going to help you to be better you know what i mean and Mm -hmm. and to own the process and you're going to have more um vestment in your own in your own trajectory right um but anyway so with last thing then what advice would you give young athletes that want to aspire to be professional, not just in tennis, but really in anything? The, I think, I mean, the key to, for young athletes, of course, is to always, to have fun to a certain point. Yeah. And, and then, cause you know, I always say that, Oh, it's so important to have fun. And then if you want to be really great at something, I, there was so many times when I was 14, 15, 16, when it wasn't fun and it was just the, let's say 90% of it, I felt like I was suffering and had to like work through, but the 10% of it, that was fun. The 10% of the day, just talking in time, whether it was just the 45 minutes of getting to play points or live points was what I lived for. That would always kind of outweigh the, the 90% of the day that I felt like I was having to suffer right. for. So, you know, it is supposed to be fun to a certain point and then it's okay for it not to be fun, you know, cause every time, parents ask this question to me I'm always yeah it's, it is true it's, it's all about having fun and right. loving what you do when you're talking to kids more so than anything but it's okay you know because then I think some kids that I've spoken to they get scared of that they're like, oh well, I'm not having fun most of, and and I I didn't say I wouldn't say that I had fun for for a majority of the time I thought I suffered way more than uh, way more than than I was actually like having fun and just just on a total high when I was out on the court. Yeah. And I think it's important that that is the reality. It's, it's okay for it not to be okay. And it's okay to not necessarily love it when you're 15, 16 and not want to wake up and do it. And it's just that that's all normal. I think everyone goes through that. It's not all, you know, like a walk in the park. It's yeah. not all sunshine yeah, and yeah. rainbows. And yeah, yeah. there's some just brutal days that you have to just get through and, and, kind of I like the word suffer you have yeah. to learn how to suffer yeah yeah and be content with it and maybe it's for months you know maybe yeah, yeah. it's months of just feeling like it's a grind yeah but I'm so glad that when that happened I was like I did, I never really questioned that oh maybe I don't love this and this is just not great for me in my mind and, and I'm glad that I never had those thoughts as a kid I think I'm thankful for my peers for Tommy and Taylor and yeah. Francis to um to have them to compete with for yeah. those thoughts, not to outweigh the others. But I think it's an important topic is it's not all supposed to be just, you know, a roller co- a theme park and an arcade. Yeah. And a bed of roses. Yeah. I think the suffering thing, it totally makes sense. You know, that's what develops. I mean, in my opinion, right. Yeah. Ultimately develops, um, tougher individuals and then appreciating the other end, you know? Yeah. Um, that's all, that's interesting, but I appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, that was it. I think, uh, hopefully people got a lot of value out of this talk and I know I did. I think it's really cool and to share the insights of a high level professional athlete like yourself. Thanks. Um, if y'all, um, uh, want to follow Riley, right. When he reenters back into the, into the, into the professional tennis world, definitely, um, search him up, you know, and follow him. Um, and if you have any questions for me in particular, you can always reach me at our email at team at athleterc.com or check us out on our website or Instagram, Facebook. And uh, we're always open to suggestions and we love helping people better themselves and, and be more driven. So um, don't hesitate to reach out and we'll catch you all next time. As you know, we're a small local practice and we don't run any ads or sell anything on this podcast but it would mean the world if you could share, write a post or word of mouth recommendation for somebody just like you that's athletic and active that wants to live their dynamic lifestyle. 
and pay some good karma and pay it forward to somebody else just like you. And who knows, you could change their world. And a 10 second review could be that avenue.